welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Room for Discussion. Today we have the honor to host a discussion with Dr. Sergei Guryev. He was the rector of the New Economic School in Moscow. He was former advisor to Prime Minister Medvedev. Uh, however, in 2013, he had to move uh, from Moscow to Paris due to, as he called it, frightening and humiliating inter interrogations by government investigators. Nowadays, he's still very involved in Russian politics and economics, is a m often seen guest at the Russian independent media outlets, and um, he is still very much involved, as we also saw in a lot of podcasts and a lot of interviews. An interesting guest with an interesting life. We will discuss the events currently in Russia and his recovery path in the future. Also, Dr. Gurev has seen both worlds of Europe and Russia, and we'll ask him to look at what do we know about Russia? Is it actually true what we know about Russia? And we look at Russia beyond Moscow. Therefore, we'll discuss, do we join us to find out? Uh, at the end, there will be room for, hopefully some room for some uh, audience questions. Uh, please send them before 12.30 so we have the time to uh, actually digest them and put them into the interview. Dr. Guryev, again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tim. Yes. Um, one can certainly argue that you had an above average turbulent life. Um, <laughs> was fleeing Moscow your most life-changing moment? Actually, yes. I think, uh, I think it was an interesting, almost cinematic moment. Uh, I should tell you that I should not complain. And uh, for every student in the audience, I should say, you should study hard and get advanced degrees because this is what makes you internationally mobile. So you can land on your feet even if you have to run. Uh, but uh, I have friends uh, who are suffering much worse, uh, uh, who are facing much worse uh, circumstances. So I am in touch uh, with Alexei Navalny, whom I know for many, many years, who's been attacked three times by now and uh, almost uh, lost his vision in 2017 and uh, now almost died in a Novichok attack and it's still not fully recovered. And so compared to that, uh, running away from Moscow and becoming a Paris in Europe, uh, becoming a professor in Paris, is uh, not that scary. But some some details there were quite uh, interesting, and indeed, one uh, um, circumstance which I would share with you because it kind of adds uh, this cinematic property to the whole experience is uh, my meeting with my wife in an airport. It's almost like a spy movie. So when I was thinking that I may have to run, but uh, was not yet sure, I came uh, to Russia one last time and she was in Paris at the time and she was supposed to travel to Russia as well. And uh, she knew that uh, I may be in trouble. And so she suggest suggested that I somehow communicate to her encoded messages uh, that I'm in trouble. So when I come to Moscow evening on Sunday, on Monday, I have a few meetings with uh, highly positioned, highly ranked uh, friends in government and private sector, asking them whether it is safe for me to be in Russia right now. And all of them say no. <laughs> and so I buy, uh, by the time the day is over, it's like, uh, I don't know, 10 p.m. Uh, so I buy the one-way ticket for Tuesday uh, to France. And, uh, and I send an SMS to my wife who is coming on Tuesday to Moscow. I'm sending an SMS, which I thought means that I'm in trouble and she didn't understand that. And, uh, and uh, I'm picking up here in the airport and I'm saying, look, in two hours, my flight is away from Moscow. I'm no, never going to be back to Moscow. And so we spend this couple of hours in the airport and uh, this is quite a conversation. She doesn't have a ticket, so she's staying in Moscow for a few more days. And uh, we have this uh, interesting conversation, like in the movie. And then she also watches whether I'm detained on my way out at the airport or not. And that was uh, also quite uh, um, scary, but uh, it worked out. And I should tell you that a few months before, already when I was facing problems, both she and myself, whenever we cross the border, would have a special procedure. So you show your passport and the passport control and they would say, wait, we need another person to look into this. And basically this procedure is they send the fact of your border crossing to the investigative unit somewhere in the center and they wait whether you should be detained right now or not. Mm -hmm. And this takes five minutes or 10 minutes, not really more, but it's 
quite painful actually to wait whether you're allowed to in or out of the country without being detained. So part of that was unpleasant, but compared to Novichok, it's just a piece of cake. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting story and definitely can be part of a movie film. Uh, so but now you're settled in, in Paris for um, quite a few years now. Um, so what we're wondering is what is the most notable difference between daily life in Moscow and in Paris? So it's a, it's a big difference, but uh, you didn't mention that. Uh, I also, after moving to Europe, I also spent three years working as chief economist of a European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which was yet another life. So I've lived several lives. But my life in Moscow prior to living was very different from simple professorial life. I was a president of a university, of a very important private university, I should say. As you said, informally, I was advising government officials and various kind of commissions, task forces, advisory panels. Uh, so that life was a very active, not really quite academic life. Today, I'm a professor. I, I, I still write columns. I, I'm advising various institutions, uh, various international organizations, that's true. But it's a much more quiet life. And until 2020, the life would be, I really just walk to work. I, do research, I write research papers, I, I write books, I go to international research conferences. So it's just great life, not busy, not hectic. Uh, I would, if I travel, I travel to international research conferences and, um, and I have time to work on research and I have time to enjoy life in Paris, which is a great place to be. And uh, we chose to live in Paris and this is yet another luxury that uh, academics have, you can actually choose where to live, and both my wife and myself are professors of economics. We got uh, jobs, and she is a professor at Paris School of Economics. I have I have a job at Sciences Po, and uh, quality of life in Paris for academics is great. But I also had these three years of hectic life in London, where I worked at a, as a chief economist at EBRD, which is based in London, where I would travel. First and foremost, every week I would travel for a weekend to see my family, London, Paris. And then every other week, I would also travel to countries of operations, to Uzbekistan, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, and then to places like Washington or Korea or, um, or, or China to talk to uh, various counterparts. So that was a lot of travel, a lot of hectic life uh, during those three years between 2016 and 2019. So, but so, normal Parisian professor life is just great mm -hmm. life. I highly recommend. <laughs> yeah, so, so you've seen definitely a lot of countries in, in that time. And, and uh, we in the West always uh, think that we know a lot about uh, Putin and, and the Kremlin, but um, we don't know a lot about the Russian people. So do you think, um, Sergey, that, uh, that you feel like um, Russian people are too often conflated with the Kremlin? I think uh, the last few years have changed that. They changed that a lot. And basically, when I arrived in Paris in 2013, you should know, I think it's, there is a difference between uh, France and some other European countries. France loves Russia. The French people just love Russia, mostly because of culture, but also because of shared history of fighting, of fighting common enemies. And, uh, and because of Russian nobility moving in 1917, 19, and further year, uh, later years to Paris. So there is a great positive attitude to Russia. And before 2014, uh, that was conflated, as you rightly said. Putin and Russia were the same thing. After 2014, people start to learn that you can love Russia and still recognize that Putin is no, a non-democratic, vicious leader who actually threatens neighboring countries. And so by now there is a change. And by now people understand these are different things. If you think about Russia watchers, people who do watch in Russia for a living, like think tanks, uh, policy advisors, Russia scholars, they all understand everything. They travel to Russia, they understand the differences. They travel not just to Moscow. So all of that is being watched. And especially social media. So a lot of information comes not through official sources, but through social media accounts. And so people based in Europe know a lot about Russia right now. If you ask me whether people based in Europe understand Uzbekistan, uh, well, that's a different story. So Russia is a, a country which everybody watches and tries to understand. Neighboring countries are much well 
are much less well understood. So right. there is there is a gap. But Russia, I think, is watched and understood pretty well. So we talk about neighboring countries, but uh, Russia itself is very diverse. Uh, Russia is presented as a complete national front, for instance, at sports games, the Olympic Games, bar the last few years. Uh, but what people don't often know is that Russia is a federation, including over 160 ethnicities. Um, and what, which identity do you think is more prevalent, like the regional one of the Chechen or the national one as a Russian? So this is a great question. I myself am not ethnic Russian. And uh, people wouldn't know that when I'm in Europe. I was born in Ossetia, I'm ethnic uh, North Ossetian. And within Russia, everybody would know that. Everybody would understand that from my last name. Everybody would know I don't belong to the main Slavic Russian identity. And uh, when today I am in Europe, I'm a privileged social category of middle age, uh, middle class white man. Huh? And uh, in Russia, I would be an ethnic discriminated minority. So I understand those challenges. And uh, your question is actually very important because if you're in Chechnya, the Chechen identity would dominate. If you are in central Russia, that would be definitely central, uh, that would be Russian identity. And so this is a challenge. Russia should be a federation. De facto, it's not really a federation, but every ethnic minority has its own ethnic identity for sure. And this is a, a, an imperial legacy, which has not been yet resolved. So Russia cannot really square the circle of whether there should be a multiculturalist or um, one superimposed national identity. Should it be like a, a melting pot or should it be multicultural? This issue has not been addressed and has not been resolved. And I live in France because I like French idea of national secular state, but there could be other approaches. And this debate is yet to be held in Russia. Today it's not held because Russia doesn't like to have free debate on those very important issues. When I say Russia now, I mean Kremlin. So this is a very painful debate. Yeah, this is a very painful debate which yet to be held. And as a, as, as a setting, I can feel it very personally that there is an, a setting identity which is very important to me. And there is also Russian identity because I speak Russian, I write in Russian, and outside of Russia, I'm Russian. And so these issues are very hard to square. So. Yes, so still there's a clear distinction, um, we have world of difference between Moscow and the rural areas uh, in Russia. Um, is this similar to what we see in the Europe, uh, Europe capital cities um, comparing to uh, the Russian standards or is it much stronger? Do you think? It is uh, much stronger. So if you want to make a career, you have to live in Moscow. St. Petersburg is kind of second, uh, but it's a very distant second. And everything is very far from Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then yet you have a number of big cities, probably 10 or 20 big cities. After that, you, re you really have a very different quality of life and career opportunities. So these issues are very, very uh, clear in, in Russia. Russia has this big inequality between especially Moscow and other places and um, quality of education, um, business headquarters, all of that is Moscow centric. There are some companies which, um, for example, place their headquarters and profit centers in St. Petersburg because uh, Russian government elite today is from St. Petersburg and to benefit St. Petersburg, they ask uh, Gazprom to build their headquarters in, in St. Petersburg. Yeah? and pay taxes in St. Petersburg. Sounds great. But if you actually ask top management of all these companies, they all have apartments in Moscow, families in Moscow, because Moscow is where things are happening. So, and so this is not uncommon for authoritarian regimes. You have to have connections to the government to prosper as a business person or as an academic. And so you have to be close. And so this is how it works. And one, one way to see it is just to look at um, um, real estate prices. You see that Moscow real estate is still very expensive. And that is because quality of life and career opportunities are all in Moscow. It's a bit like China. And if, if we look at uh, opportunities for young people uh, in Russia, it's for us in the audience also uh, quite interesting to see. Um, 
how big is the difference in opportunities for young people in in, in and around Moscow uh, or St. Petersburg at the, at the, um, uh, versus the rest of the country? So there is a huge, a huge gap, and uh, that gap is related eventually to education. Mm -hmm. And quality of education in Moscow is much higher than in the regions. And again, Moscow also has very bad universities as well. But uh, basically, if you're born outside of uh, Moscow, but you study in Moscow, you have career opportunities. That's for sure. So this is the main challenge for you. If you're, if you're born outside of Moscow, uh, I highly recommend to study in Moscow. And uh, with all critical attitude I have for the Russian government, one of the reforms which happened in the last 10 years was introduction of a national exam, what's called EGA, Unified State Exam, which actually improved opportunities for talented kids from the outside to get access to prestigious universities based in Moscow. And uh, there is research which shows it really worked. With all the criticisms of this exam, it really, really created some meritocracy and opened opportunities for people born in very small villages. If they study hard for this exam, get admitted to best universities. Yeah, and, and uh, Sergey, uh, if we have a look at the, of course, now at this moment, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and could we also see the difference in how uh, the country, the different sides of the country dealt with the pandemic uh, regarding to the differences in rural areas and capital cities in Moscow? That's a huge difference. And, uh, and this is where uh, Moscow has benefited from two very important issues. One is Moscow is extremely rich. So just in, in uh, economic terms, level of income per capita in Moscow is comparable to European countries. Uh, not to Netherlands or Luxembourg, but to median European income, right? Moscow has a huge budget. A lot of this budget is stolen, but still it's a huge budget to invest and very quickly to invest in hospitals. And this is what Moscow did in the beginning of the year. The second issue here is Moscow has a special political role. After the protests in 2011 and 12, the central government understood uh, it's very important to keep up quality of public goods in Moscow high. So at least this reason for re rebellion uh, uh, is removed. And that's why they put a reasonably competent administration in the Moscow City Hall and uh, told them, you do what you want to keep Moscovites happy, at least for the reason of hospitals and schools and parks. And this is what Moscow City government did. And uh, also what it creates, it creates a certain voice and political weight for the mayor of Moscow. Mayor of Moscow can afford to stand up and say, the federal government can say we don't have pandemic, but I, as a mayor of Moscow, I am worried. So I will build hospitals and I will help my population not to die. And there was a huge difference in handling COVID since the first wave, where the mayor of Moscow invested in new hospitals and built them quickly, and also was quite open about the threat. While the central government was hiding data and neglected the epidemic because they needed to run this uh, June and July vote on constitutional amendments that would allow Putin to stay in power forever, the, uh, the city of Moscow was quite open and did a good job. And uh, today we see a huge difference in mortality. And one of the things I should say, you should not trust official data on COVID in Russia. And uh, that applies both to cases and to deaths. In terms of cases, cases of course depend on testing and regions don't have enough tests. And deaths uh, deaths are misclassified, and so you shouldn't believe them. So what you should look at is what's called excess mortality. And excess mortality, depends how you count, already suggests that official number numbers underestimate the mortality from COVID by a factor of three or a factor of six. So we are talking about huge problem in Russia, which is underreported. Uh, but if you ask me about the gap between Moscow and uh, the regions, Moscow's done a much better job. And part of that is of political role of Moscow. And part of that is because sheer economic wealth that the Moscow city has. Is this then also the reason that the major of Moscow is the most popular politician, even though the polls are unreliable? Uh, the mayor of Moscow has been fairly popular. Is that because of his response to the pandemic? 
uh, he has recovered a lot of popularity this year. That's correct. So last year, when he beat up the protests and allowed the protesters to be beaten up, he lost a lot of popularity. But today he has recovered uh, quite a bit of popularity because of a reasonably competent response. But as you rightly said, the polls are unreliable in, in the following way. Polls also reflect the media diet, right? What you consume in terms of media matters. And Russian TV is completely controlled. And half of the population watches TV. And so if they show mayor of Moscow on TV and mayor of Moscow says things which are reasonable, he suddenly becomes popular. And so in that sense, if you show, if you show on TV Alexei Navalny who tells you how city hall of Moscow stole billions of dollars, then of course popularity of mayor of Moscow would go down, but that's not what's happening. Yeah. To go more into this unreliability of uh, news and also the, the, the national government saying things or how they handled the first wave of the pandemic, uh, a few days, a few weeks ago, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine got released with 90% chance of curing the patient. And then two days later, all of a sudden, a Sputnik vaccine got released with 92% uh, chance of curing the patient. Uh, should we take that face value? Is that to be trusted? Or is that going to be another bet, uh, propaganda tool from the Russian national government that have everything under control? So there are two issues here. One is Sputnik vaccine has not completed the tests yet. So uh, Pfizer, BioNTech has completed the first stage. UK has registered it and it's, going, it's getting ahead. Sputnik has not completed the third stage. And actually this statement, apparently this statement of 92% is based on 20 volunteers. So it's really strange. It's really bizarre. And it should be uh, considered as a blatant lie right? Non-scientific line. But the other thing, as an economist, uh, I should tell you, economists usually say, it doesn't really matter what people say, what matters is what people do. So you should look at what's called revealed preference, not the cheap talk. And uh, here, I can just give you one simple fact. Mr. Putin has not vaccinated himself. With or his daughter? <laughs> what? Well, he said his daughter got vaccinated, but uh, whether it's true or not, we don't know. And his daughter is much younger. Um, and uh, what I'm saying is he publicly says he's not, got, uh, he's not vaccinated himself, which tells you how much trust and reliability there is in Sputnik. Sputnik may be a good vaccine, but we just don't know it yet because this third stage of tests has not been completed. And that's where we are. So all these communications are very misleading, and that's the job of Kremlin. The Kremlin wants to confuse the public and confuse you. And whenever you hear something from the Kremlin, you should presume that uh, it's not fact checked and you need to fact check it somehow. So if you were a betting man, would you put money on it that it is uh, a trusting vaccine? So leave the economist I think behind? it's just too early. I think it's just too early. No, it's just, uh, it just uh, the tests are not completed. We'll see in a couple of weeks and uh, it may be a good vaccine. It's just too early. Yeah. Okay. Um, in previous interviews, we're now moving more to the fiscal side of the government response. Uh, in previous interviews, especially in the first wave, you were very critical of the Russian regimes and what they, how they handled the pandemic. Very little fiscal support. You wrote a petition and you, in very many podcasts, you had very critical comments on that the loans should have been gifts or grants. Uh, but the one thing, one of your main key points was the sovereign wealth fund and the Russia in not using that fund. It is meant for rainy days. It's 17 trillion rubles. Uh, why has it not been used by this government in this rain storm of COVID, oil crisis, and everything together? You're right. Together with the uh, colleagues, economists from Russia, from, the, from Europe, from the United States, we, say, uh, we wrote a couple of uh, open letters asking to spend this rainy day fund for the rainy day because this is the rainy day. This is a horrible, uh, horrible set of circumstances. And our argument was that if you pay people to stay home, they will stay home. If you don't pay people to stay home, they will be forced to go out, look for a job, go to work. And this is what happened. And unfortunately, what we saw was uh, the Russians were much less likely to stay home. So we have this Apple and Google mobility data, right? Where you can actually see uh, how many Russians were going to work 
and Google and Apple publish this data from cell phones um, online every week. And you can see that Russians were much less likely to observe the lockdown. And uh, the reason for that is Russians are not rich. They need money. They need to eat something. And so they go and work. And so this is where, I, unfortunately, I think Russian government preferred uh, money over lives. And that's why I'm saying we are talking about horrible access mortality data. And uh, there, is, there is this demographer, uh, demographer uh, in Russia, formerly working for Russian state statistics agency. His name is Alexei Raksha. And uh, in my project syndicate uh, op-ed recently, I referred to his Bloomberg interview where he actually uses success mortality data. And he says that we are talking about, by now, probably we are talking about 200,000 dead because of COVID. And that was a conscious decision by Russian government to prefer saving the cash for whatever they needed for, for themselves and their friends, but not helping Russians to survive the first wave. And now the same is happening with the third wave. And if you go today to the website of IMF, on the fiscal policy monitor, which tracks policy response to COVID, you'll see that Russia is spending less than average emerging market and much less than European countries, even though it has cash. It spends much less to support, support the public, support the small businesses against COVID. And I think this is horrible. Now, I should add that it was not useless what we did. So we wrote this petition, and uh, the leading opposition politician, Alexei Navalny, uh, wrote his own letter called Five Steps. And he called for the government to help the Russians and Russian doctors and Russian families with kids and so on. And he actually ran a petition and he collected immediately 100,000 uh, signatures. And he ran a poll which shows that 85% of Russians support this program. And eventually government was forced to at least pick up one of those steps. So Ru Russian government gave some money to families with kids, not much. Not enough, but at least it was not useless. And in that sense, I'm proud we did that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the IMF. Um, you briefly mentioned that maybe a reason that Putin or the Kremlin doesn't use this sovereign wealth fund is that Putin under no means whatsoever wants to be under IMF control ever again. Do you think that's a massive factor as well, or are there other things at play? This is an important factor. And... Uh, one of the things Putin is not spending this money is probably he's expecting um, he's expecting a new round of sanctions. So he wants to keep what uh, they call strategic independence. So the pride of uh, Russian establishment is that like United States and like China, Russia is an independent player. Russia can invade any country. Russia has nuclear weapons. So if you invade somebody, they will not bomb you. You are not Saddam Hussein, so you can afford to invade a neighbor. And uh, uh, you also can survive the uh, sanctions, the very painful sanctions. So by now, Russia has very little sovereign debt. But if you uh, impose, uh, if you don't impose sanctions, Russia can borrow. If you impose new sanctions on Russian sovereign debt, Russia cannot borrow. But Russia has a rainy day fund, which can help you to survive a threat of sanctions. And in that sense, what Mr. Putin says to the West, he says, I have sovereign wealth fund so I can invade another country. So it's a very- Or interfere in some election or poison somebody, so. So it's a really big political chip in the international- uh, Yes. Uh, relation space. Um, speaking of that, you said the, the letter and the petition helped. There became new fiscal policy, families got more money. Um, has that money been used like efficiently? It's also been sectors that have been underwater also been used. Um, would you rate it efficient or in what ways would you improve it? So what was done, and I think uh, it was good, but not sufficient. So Russian government just gave uh, every kid uh, 20,000 rubles per kid. Uh, every family with kids got uh, 20,000 rubles per kid, which is not enough, uh, um, but uh, at least something and, and uh, should have been done more. Uh, and of course, it's just, uh, in, in a sense, if you think about this, it's almost like uh, universal basic income for kids. And it's good because uh, in Russia, poor families are the ones which have kids. And uh, uh, this money was used uh, efficiently, but just not enough. People buy, uh, bought food, and it's good for people who produce and sell food. Uh, of course, whole industries in Russia suffered. We talk about tourist industries, small, medium-sized businesses, I don't know, 
gyms, services, restaurants, all kinds of stuff is now underwater. Russian government has done certain things which is uh, really stingy and not sufficient. So they would say, if you don't fire people, we'll give you per every person you uh, keep on the payroll, we give you one minimum wage. This is, of course, very different from what European governments do. European governments give uh, full wage or 80% of the wage, which means uh, many businesses in Russia would have to close instead of doing that. Because if you keep a person on payroll and you get one minimum wage from the government, uh, you have to give the rest to the employee and uh, you just don't have this money because you don't sell anything. As a restaurant, you don't sell uh, any services. And so it's, uh, it's not always been very rational and it's been very little. As I said, uh, if you look at the IMF website, uh, Russian uh, policy response is like 3% of GDP, while uh, advanced economies on average uh, did 10% uh, of GDP and emerging markets uh, on average uh, about 5%. Yeah, and um, also one point that we definitely want to discuss uh, with you uh, is the your recently developed theory about uh, the so-called uh, informational autocracies. Uh, very interesting. Um, could you maybe explain uh, what you mean by this for our audience? And uh, by using the example, uh, wh what you already mentioned during the interview, is uh, the recent poisoning of uh, the opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Could you maybe explain the theory with... Uh, Yes, thank you for asking this question. So uh, together with my co-author, political scientist from University of California in Los Angeles, uh, Daniel Trisman, we have written a few papers. Uh, to be precise, up to now, three papers have been published. And the one that gives you the better view of this, and which is also uh, quite non-technical, is the one published in 2019 in the Journal of Economic Perspectives called informational autocrats and basically our argument is that modern autocracies no longer work through repression mass repression and fear and ideology more modern autocracies pretend to be democracies and they try to convince the public that the leaders are really popular and of course in modern society it's not an easy job because you have people who understand what's going on we call these people informed elites, but you may just think about educated people or people who care about politics. And these people have to be silenced so they don't communicate the truth to the general public. And so the way to silence those informed people is either to use targeted repression, censorship, or cooptation. So you would have a lot of smart people in Russia who do not oppose the regime, because they're part of the regime, because they're paid to be uh, co-opted into status quo. And then you also have a lot of smart people in Russia who oppose the regime, but are repressed. And as you rightly uh, mentioned, one of those examples is Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader in Russia. And what is important for Putin is to say, we don't have opposition leaders in Russia. We don't have opposition. All opposition is uh, Communist Party or Zhirinovsky Party. And uh, Alexei Navalny is not a politician, he's a blogger. And uh, uh, when a position leader is poisoned, the modern informational autocrat doesn't do that publicly. So if you go back to 20th century, many dictators would kill or imprison their opponents publicly. They would say, these are the opposition, we uh, have an open court trial, and uh, we will put them in jail for being against my regime. Today, informational autocrats, majority of autocracies actually say, no, this guy is a fraudster. This guy didn't pay taxes. This guy forged documents. And this is not just in Russia. I can give you examples on this from Malaysia and Turkey and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. in case of Navalny, what is important, Russian yeah. government denied complicity. They said, it's not us. Mm -hmm. And I think the best piece of evidence on this is the leak of conversation between Vladimir Putin and Emmanuel Macron, where Vladimir Putin to told Macron, Navalny wasn't poisoned. If he was poisoned, he poisoned himself, or he was poisoned by somebody from Latvia. And this was so ridiculous that indeed looks like Emmanuel Macron leaked this, con uh, leaked this information to the press, which is very unusual. 
And so this is a typical thing. Now, uh, Putin says, I'm a democratic leader. I don't kill people. I don't censor people. This is how it works. Uh, but, people but love did, me. Did it work? Did it work? Um, what, what they are assuming in Russia? So uh, the citizens? Uh, the majority of citizens don't know who poisoned Navalny. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. And uh, so if you run polls, you see that there are some people, but they're a minority, are convinced that Navalny was poisoned by the government. And I think this is exactly what happened. But majority of Russians do not know who poisoned Navalny but because they are bombarded uh, with all these theories. But are these polls reliable? As we said before, uh, the polls That's are... a great question. That's a great question. I think they are reliable in a way that uh, people are not afraid to say that. And there is research uh, with so-called list experiments. So, for example, when Putin's popularity was 80%, researchers would try to see to what extent this is uh, true or people are just afraid to say they don't like Putin. And what they did, they ran what's known in political science as list experiments. Maybe you know about this thing, but let me explain very quickly. I show you a list of, say, four politicians and ask you how many of them you like. I don't ask you which one you like, but uh, you just tell me uh, you would say one, you would say two. On average, the society likes, I don't know, 1.7 of these four. And then I take another group of people and to them I show five politicians, the previous four plus Putin. And I ask you how many do you like? And uh, since we have a law of large numbers, statistical methods, we can actually say the average without Putin is 1.7. The average with Putin is 2.4. So the difference between the two is 0.7, which means 70% approve Putin. And so these studies showed that when public polls would give you 80% approval, list experiments would give you 70% approval. And basically that means that these polls over exaggerate support of the government, but not by much, maybe by 10 percentage points. It, so this it, is. But this in is that way, um, Putin lacked a bit uh, as an informational autocracy. Uh, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is, is that so, a but, uh, but uh, uh, overall, overall, one other thing which I think is uh, very important to Netherlands is the story about the uh, MH17 flight. Again, where Russia behaved exactly the same way, where Russia created a bunch of theories, each of which was fact-checked and dismissed, and is now the court hearings are going on in Netherlands, where the judge actually says, this theory is wrong, this theory is wrong, this theory is wrong. We see that one by one. But this is what Russian government does, especially for the domestic consumption, to convince the Russian public that there is a confusion. We don't know. There are too many theories. We cannot really judge what's going on. And uh, this, is, this is exactly why, uh, why and how they, they do that. And they did it with MH17, and they are doing that with uh, Alexei Navalny as well. So they say it was Ukrainian jet fighter which uh, shot down this plane, or, uh, uh, or uh, it were, uh, uh, maybe it was somebody else we don't know. Maybe, maybe they were aliens or something like this, so we don't know. Um, is there, uh, with listening to the information, informational autocracy, is there a big difference in age or in, uh, what's, the, what's the bigger difference in age or the location where people live that they believe the government's um, uh, news outlets or at least the like about Navalny or MH17? Well, that's of course all about the informational diet and in what, what information you consume. Of course, internet uh, is helping you to get better information. That's why Russian government is trying to, uh, to censor internet. And right now, the main battleground is YouTube. And uh, we mentioned Navalny many times. Uh, Navalny, Navalny's YouTube channel is now watched by millions of people. But that's not enough. You need tens of millions, right? And uh, Navalny's uh, support is growing, and this is why he's being poisoned. I should mention, you mentioned podcasts. I also have a YouTube channel, and I, every Russian speaker should subscribe to this YouTube channel where every week I, I talk to people and try to talk uh, about what post-Putin Russia should be like. And uh, I think this is important to talk about those things so people are not afraid of uh, democratic transition in Russia. But going back to Navalny's YouTube channel, we have a paper with Nikita Melnikov and Yekaterina Zhuravska, which shows how access to mobile broadband internet and social media actually increases critical attitudes towards government. 
In one of the case studies, this is a paper which looks information from across the world. It's, uh, it's now forthcoming in the top economics journal, quarterly journal of economics. But um, one of the examples we use is Navalny's movie about Medvedev well, called He's Not Demon to You. So this movie, which was uh, released in 2017, um, uh, was viewed by almost 40 million people. This is the most successful movie Navalny produced. And it completely destroyed Medvedev's career. And we show how Medvedev lost popularity and has never recovered it since. And we also show that, yes, if you have access to YouTube, you are more likely to be critical of Medvedev. And uh, this is very, very important because this movie was not shown on TV. It was only viewable on YouTube. But we also show that if you talk to people who have access to YouTube, you also get a negative impact in terms of attitude to Medvedev. So if you talk to somebody who watched this movie, you de uh, downgrade your opinion of Medvedev as well. Not by as much, but still. And so the answer to you is, it's uh, whether you have access to social media like YouTube or you don't. And of course, older people are less likely to be um, on internet and uh, uh, rural areas are less likely to have access to internet. But this is changing. Russia now is much better connected and the main, main battleground is censorship online. Putin is doing that. Putin is uh, uh, trying to censor various uh, social media. And as we speak, they're actually trying to somehow censor YouTube as well. But I'm not sure it's going to be very easy because YouTube is not just political, uh, uh, political platform, it's also entertainment platform. All right. Uh, going back to Putin, uh, on the one hand, Putin this year changed the constitution in the middle of the COVID pandemic to increase his power, to um, increase his term limit. But on the other hand, perceived negative events happened, like the failed COVID response, uh, the oil crisis, which he insti instigated, and the poisoning of Navalny. Which, um, so what kind of effect, if you sum everything up and get to, an, uh, in the end, to an uh, to a conclusion, what kind of effect will 2020 have on Putin's grip on power? So I think so far he is he lost all these battles, as you mentioned, and I think in longer run uh, they will play out a major role. They will play a major role in uh, uh, distrust to Putin, because right now we have second wave, and in the first wave they try to hide. Um, uh, COVID death because they needed to run this military parade and this constitutional vote. Now they cannot hide it anymore because the second wave is really catastrophic, especially outside of Moscow. And uh, the very fact that Putin is not helping the families and the fact that the healthcare system is not doing well and it's been underfunded and the fact that the new budget actually and uh, uh, the new budget is, is exactly what you expect. They invest in state media, but they cut spending on healthcare. So that's an informational autocracy at its best. People die, but what's most important is that people don't know. And I think uh, it's uh, 2020 in longer term has been a disastrous year for Putin in terms of his popularity and support. But in the short run, I should say that because of the pandemic, there are no protest rallies. Protest rallies are completely uh, forbidden. And also, Poisoning of Navalny was a big blow for the opposition. Navalny is extremely effective. And he's recovering now. He will come back probably uh, soon. And uh, maybe when pandemic is off and protest rallies hopefully will come back, situation may change. But uh, currently, you don't see any imminent threat for Putin, except for two other things, Belarus and Khabarovsk. So Khabarovsk protests keep going on since summer. Belarus protests keep going on since summer. And we don't see what Putin can do about this. And uh, uh, that, may, that may eventually bring his support down. But by now, his support is lower than uh, two years ago, but still high. But of course, uh, in the future, in uh, 2021, uh, you have the Russian parliament, the Duma uh, elections. Um, could this election uh, potentially lost by the current government? I think uh, Russian government is very worried about this and what they are going to do. They will not register any opposition candidate and they will steal the election as well. So what they're going to do, they will allow for this uh, 
multi-day vote, which makes it easier to steal the election and uh, uh, make it difficult for observers to see what's going on. They will also introduce online vote, which uh, unlike in the US or in Estonia will be a major tool for stealing the votes. Mm -hmm. And so the vote count will be uh, unprecedentedly fraudulent. But on top of that, they will not allow any opposition candidate to run. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't think that this will be a, a, a change of a game changer. No, I think I think uh, Russian government knows that, and they will do a lot not to not to lose and this election. We, we, but overall, I think I think I think the the situation is changing exactly because of the factors we mentioned: income stagnation, and actually today's Russians' incomes are uh, more than 10 percent lower than uh, in 2013. And of course, pandemic. And pandemic is not finished yet. And uh, mm -hmm. by the end of the year, we'll probably have 300,000 of Russians uh, dying, dying because of COVID. And uh, when you think about this, this is a huge, huge number, actually much higher than in the US in terms of per capita in most European countries. And do you think maybe we've, we've talked uh, a lot, of course, about the rural areas of Russia? Do you think that Duma will be more diverse um, after the elections of 2021? Well, it's, uh, it's a great question. I think uh, uh, the current plan announced, well, it's not announced, it's leaked uh, last week, that um, Putin uh, wants United Russia, the ruling party, to get constitutional majority, uh, which means two thirds. The current, um, the current uh, approval rating of United Russia is 30%. So there'll be a lot of uh, fraud but maybe there'll be some diversity because they will need new popular faces. They will need faces which rep uh, represent uh, people who are connected to people. And maybe there'll be new uh, faces that represent rural areas in particular. Now, I should say when we say rural areas, um, in Russia, 75% live in cities. Okay, mm -hmm. Russia is an extremely educated country. If you uh, Russia has more people per capita with tertiary education than any European country. It, it's only competing with uh, Canada and Korea. So we shouldn't say that rural areas are the core Russia. Russia is not Moscow, but Russia is urban and educated. And so it's not, it's not, uh, it's not a country where a rural vote is the majority. Okay, thank you. Um, to come back to what you uh, said just before about uh, the, the Belarus riots regarding the election, you said that the Russian government is most likely going to steal the election or at least mix the results. Would you expect a cert the same public outcry or is it going to be immediately squashed? So it's a great question. In 2019, the Russian government did not register opposition candidates in Moscow city election. Moscow City Parliament election, and there was a major outcry and big protest, which was very costly for Russian government. Uh, this time, the Russian government will try to play it smarter. What that means, I don't know. Uh, they will probably just not allow for protest rallies, but we'll see. We'll see. There is also this intelligent vote or vote smart strategy by Navalny, which helps to uh, hurt United Russia even when. Uh, real opposition candidates are not registered. So we'll see how it works out. I was ready but in Belarus, in Belarus, yeah, I'll explain what it is. But in Belarus, I would just say an important thing. Lukashenko made a huge mistake registering one opposition candidate, Svetlana Tikhanovska. And this is a typical mistake for a 20th century dictator. A male chauvinist dictator thought women, women have no chance. But the opposition united around this candidate and she won. In Russia, Mr. Putin may be a 20th century person, but around him, he has a sophisticated group of advisors who know what to do and what not to do. And they will not do a mis make a mistake like this. Okay, uh, thank you. We just uh, received some audience questions and we definitely want to discuss that with you. Um, so the first question is, um, how do you see the uh, Russian oil and gas exports developing uh, in the future? And how will this affect Russia's energy relations with China and the EU? So I think this is the biggest threat to the regime, which is the green transition in Europe. And Russia is really worried about this. And the COVID pandemic only accelerated 
the green transition in Europe. Uh, there are several factors which you observe firsthand, uh, which is first and foremost, we will probably travel less after 2020. We will talk to each other on Zoom more, even when pandemic is over. And uh, that means that demand for oil will be lower. Second, green politicians will tell us, look, this is what happens when you, um, when you uh, expand and uh, uh, subdue nature. Nature responds in very unusual ways and climate change will result in more pandemics. And pandemics are extremely costly as we saw this year. And so probably it is cheaper to invest in uh, anti-climate change policies than to just go ahead for economic gains. And so they'll be easier to sell um, slow down growth, but also slow down climate, climate change policies. So in that sense, this conversation will be very different after 2020. And that means that transition towards uh, net zero will be faster. Before the pandemic, the various forecasts would say that global oil consumption would peak sometime between 2030 and 2035. Today, we are talking before 2030, maybe even within the next seven years. Next seven years are important because this is the MFF, the EU, EU budget, European Commission's multi-annual financial framework uh, foresees carbon tax, and it will also be a border uh, adjustment tax for sure. So if you have a carbon tax in Europe, European companies will say, it's unfair for us to compete with dirty producers from Russia and China. And there'll be a border tax adjustment. And that means Russia will face a major challenge, both in exports of, uh, of fossil fuels, but also exports of goods produced in Russia with non-green technology. So this carbon tax will force Russia to change. And uh, I guess in the long run, it's good for Russia, but in the short run, that means that uh, the Russian government budget will have less oil revenue. So might, this is this is where we are. Might this be a reason why the sovereign wealth fund has been left untapped, that Putin foresees this transition? This is one of the reasons, yes. yes. This is one of the reasons. And today, you know, the oil price today recovered to the level which is comfortable for Russia. Today's oil price is about $40 per, bar per, 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 per barrel. This is roughly the price which helps to break even, but the volumes have decreased. In order to keep the oil price at 40 rather than at 30, there is this OPEC plus deal where Russian OPEC cut their volumes to keep oil price higher. And that means that this, the amount of oil revenues today is smaller. And this is why Russia needs to cut spending. And as I mentioned, the way Russia cuts spending is scary. Russia cuts healthcare spending, but not state media spending. Yes. Um, the second audience questions, uh, which what we received are, is what are in your view the most difficult challenges or the most difficult challenge that a future Russia president will have to face in the post-Putin era? Well, this is where I would really say, watch my videos on my YouTube channel. And I'm, I'm sorry it's only in Russian, but the main audience is in Russia, of course. And unfortunately, the main message is challenges will be everywhere. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, this, country, this country is stagnating, has been stagnating for 10 years, and probably there will be more stagnation in the coming years. And uh, the, uh, the main challenge will, the main challenges will be multifold. And one challenge is to restore relations with the rest of the world, to remove sanctions. The other challenge is to fight corruption. And we saw in many countries, and I think Ukraine is a sorry example of that, where every new administration fails to fight corruption and uh, gets kicked out exactly because the public wants a cleaner administration. And the same is true in many other countries. So we need to be sure that the next president or next government, next parliament is clean. So this is very, very important. And the other thing is uh, the public mentality. So Russians, many Russians are still believing in this imperial narrative that Russia is encircled by enemies and uh, we need to fight the West, we need to fight everybody else. While Russia should become not an empire but a normal nation state and Russia should focus on developing its own 
economy and quality of life for its people. And so everything will be a challenge. Russia needs human capital. Russia needs a modern education system. It's a challenge. Russia needs to upgrade upgraded healthcare system. It's a challenge. Russia needs to upgrade its infrastructure. It's a challenge. And Russia needs to undertake green transition itself. It's a challenge. Russia is one of the most energy inefficient countries. If you uh, improve energy efficiency, you can actually save a lot of energy. And uh, in that sense, there are many things you can do, but uh, all of that is going to be a challenge. Now, the main takeaway from my videos is it's all doable. It's all not rocket science. Other countries have done that, and Russia should be able to do that as well. Yeah. Um, so if you want to have a light workload, you should not want to have that job. Um, and speaking of a timeline, when do you, f if you have estimations, of, uh, when could a post-Putin era happen? Is it in the next 20 years, 30 years, 10 years? So it's, a, it's a, something that, as a scholar of non-democratic regimes, I can tell you these things are extremely hard to predict. There are non-democratic regimes that uh, preside over stagnating or even falling incomes and then still are in power for decades. And then some uh, are gone because of a short time crisis. And this is a very sophisticated regime, very sophisticated information autocracy, very competent macroeconomic uh, management team. So there are many things because of which this regime may last longer than others. But on the other hand, uh, all dictators make mistakes. And uh, the way Putin managed the pandemic, I think, is a mistake. Not, not the vicious plan, but it's, I think it's a mistake. He could have done better. Also, he's done many things uh, that he shouldn't have done, like interfering in American elections and so on. And um, we see that he's making mistakes, and so he may actually, um, uh, the regime change may come sooner rather than later. And so I, I would say that by 2030, we'll have another regime. Whether this regime will be better or worse, mm -hmm. I don't know. Whether this change will happen by 2025, I don't know. But the discontent is growing, and 2020 eventually will be one of the factors that will add to this discontent. And um, already within the elites, you see a lot of unhappiness that uh, there is no growth and there is no plan for growth. Russian, as I said, Russia is stagnating, and there is no plan to get out of stagnation for the next 10 years. So, and one of the things I would mention, in 2012, Putin promised certain quantitative targets for GDP growth, not met. In 2018, Putin uh, promised more targets. And uh, in July, he said, these targets now have to be pushed from 2024 to 2030. There is just no strategy, no plan. And uh, of course, people understand that. And people are asking, maybe we should in another region. Yeah. We should have another region. Uh, back in 2013, in the New York Times, you mentioned that you will not return to Russia. We're talking about regime changes. Um, has this changed? Do you see yourself returning to Russia? So what happened to me, I mentioned to you that I worked in EBRD as an EBRD employee. I had diplomatic immunity and actually went to Russia three times as an international bureaucrat. And most importantly, I didn't just go to Moscow. I did come back from Moscow. So, But uh, honestly, it is not safe for me to travel to Russia right now without diplomatic immunity. And uh, after, after the regime change, of course, why not? And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I count on uh, living a long life. And so one of the things which, uh, which we did uh, with uh, Alexei Navalny, who visited me right before the, the pandemic, uh, we ran a few kilometers with him. And I do run occasionally and recommend everybody to stay healthy. And so Navalny recently wrote a post where he said that, uh, since I run regularly, I was in a good shape. And the doctor said that was one of the major factors that uh, helped me to survive the Novichok poisoning attack. So we all need to live long. And this is one of the sayings uh, in Russian language that if you want to see a change in Russia, if you want to see a better life, you'd better to live long. So this is a piece of advice for an older person to you, stay healthy. Well, I think that's a really nice <laughs> concluding remark. Thank you, Dr. Ger uh, thank you, Sergey, for joining us today uh, for this interview. It's been a pleasure. Very interesting uh, interview. Uh, to the audience, we would like to say uh, thank you for watching. Uh, next Wednesday, on the 9th of December at 1,
we have an interview with two art journalists about the Dutch Harvey Weinstein in the art world, Julian Anderweg. Uh, I hope to see you then soon. Uh, once more, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Guria, for joining us. It's been really nice. Yes, thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this Northern European approach to starting on time and finishing on time. <laughs> I think it's great and you should be proud of this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.